an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus. So that tells us the book of Ephesians is written to saints, people already saved. All right? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Kenneth Weist, pretty good Greek scholar, I think, says this grace is sanctifying grace and the peace is tranquilizing peace. So it's grace that makes us holy and godly and peace that lets us rest in that grace. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath, you might underscore that or parentheses, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so now the apostle is going to begin to explain to us some of these spiritual blessings. He said all spiritual blessings. And now he's going to explain some of those to us. According as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that, and that's a very important word, that word that draws our attention to God's purpose for choosing us, before the foundation of the world. Now, if you think of the God having the absolute knowledge of every individual on the globe, why would he choose me or you? It's not like he was just so limited. All right, I'll take you because you're all we got. No, he's not limited. According as it has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that, or for the purpose, we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. See, God was motivated by himself. He wasn't motivated by me. He didn't see something very enticing about me or you. This is for himself, all right? Uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. You realize we exist for God's pleasure? So often I get the idea in talking to people, they, they've got the idea that God wants us to be happy. But uh, Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. In creation, God was not concerned about my pleasure. In creating me, God was not motivated or influenced by concerns for my pleasure. God created me for his pleasure. God created you for his pleasure. We get that all out of kelter. I again go back to Mr. Gill. We are guests in God's world. Verse 6 now. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved. The title of our lesson this morning, or the message, Accepted in the Beloved. Heavenly Father, thank you for the word of God. And I pray, dear God, you'd give us grace to understand 
these spiritual blessings and just this one we look at this morning. I pray in Christ's name, amen. Uh, all spiritual blessings there in verse 3 and then in verse 6, he draws our attention to this fact. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Now there's some thought we need to understand. This is an amazing wonder that God would love me. Uh, I've said this before. Whenever I think about the love of God, I, I, in my mind, I'm not saying this is theologically correct and exact. I'm just telling you in my thinking. And you are by no means required to think like I do. It'd be a terrible world if everybody thought like I do. All right? Well, I don't know. My life might be a little more pleasant uh, if everyone would think like I would, drive like I would, you know, and then we could... And, uh, that gets worse the longer you mess with it. All right? We were not acceptable by nature. Can you understand that? We had to be made acceptable. He made us accepted in the beloved. He made us accepted in an exclusive group. Everyone on the globe is not in this group. Can we see that? I was thinking about, and I love to preach from the Song of Solomon, especially chapter 2. And the Bible said, He brought me to the banqueting house, and His banner over me is love. Is that banner over everybody in God's world? Well, someone talked to Pharaoh. And to Esau, I've preached a sermon, I think I've preached it here years ago, from Nahum chapter 1. Is God emotional? And it talks in, in Nahum chapter 1, you'll find words like fury, indignation, wrath, vengeance, and then as you read on, goodness and mercy. But uh, as a society, we've got the love of God overloaded. And I can never say enough good about the love of God. But the, the whole idea of love is that it is the counterpart to hate. And in the scriptures, both are there. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Look with me in the book of Romans chapter 9 and verse number 25. Romans chapter 9 and verse 25. As he saith also in Osi or Hosea, I will call them my people which were not my people. And her beloved, which was not beloved. You remember as we studied a few weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, says we were strangers and aliens and outcasts without God, without Christ, without a hope. We were not beloved. Now then, I hope you can understand this next statement. That makes it so very dangerous, to me it does, to tell people, do you know God loves you? When they might be condemned. He that believeth not, John 3, 18, is condemned already. I tell you, God will love you. But if you're going to live and dwell in your condemnation, you're going to live and dwell and die in condemnation. You're not going to... It's like the great theologian John Gill said, 
They have no feeling for the love of God. Ephesians 4 verse 19 says they are past feeling. Mr. Gill said they have no sensation. They, they cannot relate to the love of God because they are condemned. John 3, 36, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Some will take this and misconstrue it and go out and say, Brother Chuck doesn't believe God loves sinners. That's not what I'm saying. That's not. He commended his love toward us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. But I'm telling you, the sinner is not under the love. He's outside of that love. He's not beloved. We had the, the, the grammar of the sentence, he made us accepted in the beloved. So first of all, we see the amazing wonder of this. We are no longer strangers and aliens and foreigners to this. I preached a while back, abolished enmity from Ephesians 2, where it says he has abolished the enmity. We could not in our sins see, feel, know, recognize, experience the great love that God has. We're opposed to it. He made us accepted. That brings us secondly to the glorious work. First, the amazing love. In that condition that God... Now remember what God knows and what God sees. And I've told you before about the first time that I saw Diana. I had come to the Arlington Baptist College and then thought I had made a mistake and God had made a mistake, so I quit and went home for a semester. And the pastor of the home church, Brother John Duckett, said, God doesn't make any mistakes, you get back up there. And so I had to wait a semester. and I mean, that's all I needed was for the pastor to tell me. I was going to go to some school down in Florida. But uh, God said, I mean, uh, God did say it, I guess, through the pastor. He said, now, Brother Chuck, God didn't make any mistakes. As soon as you can, you get back up there. So I was out of semester. Well, during that semester, all of these kids from this was before the days of email and computers and cell phones. This was all letters. Young people had to write back then. Stick something in an envelope, buy a stamp and put on it and mail it, you know. So anyway, I get, keep getting all of these letters. You gotta get back up here and see this new girl. And, and you know, all of this. So there's all this people, several of them. So I get back up and I never see the first time I saw her. And I go, you know, it's like Gomer Powell. Shazam, you know, right there. God didn't do that. He didn't look at any of us in our brawn and in our strength and in our height and our big booming voice and go, Shazam. None of you glamorous ladies as God looked at it and said, man, I made a good in that time. Ladies, do you ever read that verse where God says to the men, be not bitter against them? <laughs> You see, the natural tendency of God doesn't intervene and give us help. Y'all just hook us and then we get bitter. <laughs> you, can you see this, folks? Can you understand? God didn't look at any of us and go, wow. He had every reason to open up the earth and swallow us up into damnation. But his mercy, to me, it's marvelous grace that God would even look. Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 says, the Lord looked down from heaven. In my Bible, I've written grace. Luke 19, the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And he knew they were lost. He knew why they were lost. And with all of this knowledge, well, look, I'll just get another one. 
somebody better. No, he came to Houston after me. You see, the, the amazing love. And then secondly, the glorious work. Ephesians 1 verse 6, he made us accepted in the beloved. Now go over just a page or across the page to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You understand that? God did all the work to make us us accepted in the beloved. I wasn't beloved. He made me beloved. Before the foundation of the world, we read there in Ephesians chapter 1. Before Mount Everest. Before the deep oceans. I, I, I like to watch the National Geographic channel. And uh, I was watching it the other day, and they were showing that there are mountains in the deep ocean that are taller from base to summit than Mount Everest. And they're covered in water. And there are volcanoes going on down in this base of these mountains. And they're forming all the time. And then you, they, they're in this high-tech submarine traveling around because the water pressure is so great that humanity cannot survive the weight of the water. But all of a sudden, there goes a little fish that can survive the weight of the water. And then you'll go over the way, and there they'll show you there's all this assortment of little shrimp and crabs, and they can survive the weight of the water. Our nuclear powered submarines that we have, the steel on them is not thick enough to survive the weight of the water. Of that pre- they can't go. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of feet deep. I read once, the water where the Titanic sank, they dropped this robot thing, put it on a big table, and they start dropping it straight down, vertical. I think it takes just free falling. If I remember right, it takes two hours to get to the depths. You see, this glorious creator has done the work to make us accepted in the beloved. I hope you can understand the analogy there. Before the foundation of the world, look with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse number 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. And we just read in Ephesians 1. Now, don't get all worried or bummed out, what frustrated or whatever, about this word election. It is controversial in Christian theology, but it's in controversial. But all the controversy is man-made. God's not the author of controversy. We, it gets controversial when we try to make it something it's not. Election is God's decision to save. Okay? He didn't correspond with me about this or with anyone else. It's his, his decision. But our thought in our verse is, knowing, brethren, beloved. We are beloved of God. Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, please. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. 
but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But, a contrasting thought, we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because he hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Isn't that wonderful? But from the beginning, and we are beloved. By his blood, he brought us to God. He suffered for our sins, 1 Peter 3, 18, that he might bring us to God. Going back to Song of Solomon, chapter 2, he brought me to the banqueting house. You understand something? I wasn't going I wasn't standing outside in line wishing I could get a ticket and get in. He came and got me. He died for my sin. Ephesians 2, verse 15 and 16, we read, He abolished our iniquity, our sin. He washed us from our sins in His own blood and made us kings and priests unto God. You see what he's done for us in making us accepted in the beloved. Now then, we talk about this beloved being an exclusive group. But more importantly, we need to understand the person of this beloved. Who is the beloved? That's Jesus Christ. He is God's beloved son. I've told you a time or two along the way, more than some 160 times in Paul's writing, he refers to us as being in Christ. We read in Ephesians 1 and in Colossians 2, in him, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So he abolished our sin. He tr- Look with me in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, Whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he has made us accepted in him. Romans 5 verse 19 tells us where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. He overpowered our sin, Romans 5, 19 and 20. He made us accepted in the beloved. Now understand this very quickly. None of this is accomplished by man. This is not something we receive as a result of accomplishments. All right? Uh, I don't even know what has happened to them over the years. I, I had a, a few trophies I got in high school from playing basketball and that. Uh, went to college and because I stayed long enough and did the work, I, I, I got a degree. Well, salvation is not something that God gives us as a result of our Accomplishment. I heard a preacher say something the other day that at first it alarmed me, but then I thought about it. It's absolutely true. God requires nothing because he did it all. Now, because of what we did, we call out to him as Lord and Savior. Because he redeemed us from our sin, his redemption produces in us that turning to Christ. But God was not lonely. He he didn't need me. His regeneration, his sanctification. Why why do we try to be godly? Why? 
because of God's sanctification working in us. So God doesn't require anything from us. He does it all. That's the idea, you see. And that make, to me, that makes God very trustworthy, very reliable. That there's a refuge. God doesn't require anything. He's doing it all. And the great wonder of that is, and he gives us the credit, the blessing, because we believe, you see. Very quickly, a beautiful wardrobe for the beloved. You go someplace, you're, you're going, you know, you're going to be going to a big banquet or something. And what do you ladies, first thing you say, I don't have anything to wear. And your husband goes to the closet and says, what? What's all of this? You know? He dressed us, Isaiah 61, verse 10, in the garments of his salvation. The privileges of the beloved very quickly. The garments of salvation. He's dressed us in his righteousness. Remember there in the gospel of Luke, the story of the prodigal son. I, I, I love that. I, I don't know. It, 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 I, I, I'm convinced that speaking of the conversion of every individual, not just, well, he, he's a real prodigal. But you understand that God says... Bring out the best robe. And notice the amazing grace in this. God says, bring out the best robe and hand it to him. No, that's not what God says. God says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Can you see the amazing grace on that? Put the ring on his finger. Put shoes on his feet. You see the privilege of the redeemed? The privilege of the beloved, all right? God dresses us in the garments of his salvation. He gives us the shoes of sonship, puts his ring on our fingers. The great privileges, the love of the Father. He washes us from all of our filth. Read Ezekiel chapter 16. You ought to read that often. God puts the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Isn't that something? The privilege of the beloved. Not only does he do all of these things for us, he puts his spirit within us. He put the spirit of his son into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Galatians chapter 4 and Romans chapter 8. And the Holy Spirit is the spirit of sanctification. And that spirit causes us to behave like the beloved. Again, God's doing it. If you see anything godly in me, it's not a bunch of achievements. It's the sanctification of God working. God does it. So what love, what grace, what work that God is doing in making us accepted in the blood? Then one of these days, as I, I preached here a while back in the doctrine of glorification, we'll go home to be with the Lord or the Lord comes back for us. And the first John three says in verse two, we'll be like him. We'll be like no more of this. I had to go uh, for an examination the other day and a bunch of tests for our our hospitalization insurance you've all been through those things you know and the report comes back and it says uh, triglycerides are high blood sugar was all right you know and all of this and then cholesterol moderately high saying all this all these things that are going wrong with us you know, uh, they, they always have to comment about body mass, fat content. It's none of their business. You know, you cut your hand real bad. You go into the doctor for stitches, and what happens? He puts you on a scale. 
Well, honey, just sewed up. You don't have to know how much I weigh. Well, he does to prescribe the medication and all that. You understand, folks, one of these days, our acceptance in the beloved is going to be glorified in the beloved. Let's stand together, ask our folks to come lead us in a song. And I ask you this morning, you see, you can preach a sequel to this message, I guess. Unaccepted in the beloved. What happens if you're not accepted in the beloved? The fact that God had to make us accepted in the beloved is evidence that some are not. And there was a time when we were not. And God.